So this week, uh, a, a very big thank you uh, to Karen Goodkind, who's going to come and talk to us um, about her, her journey as a professional volunteer. Karen um, has worked um, in uh, the charitable uh, organisations for almost 20 years um, and has been in some uh, inspirational uh, projects for various charities. And I think I'm right in saying you're, you're a, a trustee for UJIA at the moment. So uh, welcome, Karen, and thank you very much for doing this. And um, over to you. Well, thank you, Lawrence, and uh, happy Valentine's Day. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for your warm introduction and, um, and, and to all of you for zooming in to hear my story. It's been a great privilege to serve the community through volunteering. And I can testify that when you give something of yourself, you get back much more in return. And um, over the years, I've met many inspirational people and learned a huge amount from my peers. And this morning, I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've made happen. Um, but I want to stress that I couldn't have done it alone. So I wanted to thank you, Jaya, for being the vehicle and for all that you've inspired me to do. So um, a little bit of background. I was born in Manchester in 1957, which was nine years after the declaration of the State of Israel. My father, Gordon Davis, was a respected leader in our community. He founded our local shul, the Assurance Synagogue in South Manchester. He was a very passionate Zionist and his father, my grandfather, Samuel, was the president of the Lubavitch Zionist Society pre-independence. I never knew that existed. Anyway, my, my father's eldest brother, Michael, um, he was a professor of medicine. Actually, he became the Israeli delegate for the World Health Organization. Um, and I'm just wondering what he would have made of, uh, of the situation today. Um, anyway, he made Aliyah with his wife in 1948. So I've got Sabra cousins. I visited Israel annually from a very early age. Um, I've got fabulous memories of Pesachs in Jerusalem, summer holidays at the Acadia. Uh, I can vouch for the fact it hasn't changed at all. Um, I've, I've traveled around the historical sites of Israel and I spent a long summer volunteering on a kibbutz. So I grew up in an environment when it was expected that as a Jew, you supported and loved Israel unconditionally. So regardless of the political landscape, my feelings for Israel and my support of Israel has remained unshakable throughout my life. So I guess the reason I became involved with UJA um, is because I want people to feel the same way as I do. And especially today, the younger generations because they struggle so much with Israel's complex narrative. Anyway, my father was a huge influence on the way I connected to Israel, but tragically he passed away at the age of 53. And for many years after, I kind of think I was in a spiritual wilderness and I didn't go back to Israel very much. But fast forward quite a few years, in October 2003, I suddenly had this burning desire to go. And I was newly married to my uh, second husband, Peter. And I said to him one day, you know, come on, Peter. Um, it, was, it was actually towards the end of the Intifada. No one had been going to Israel. And I said to him, come on, let's go to Israel. You know, we'll stay at the Hilton. Well, we're not, we're not going to go on a bus. Um, we're not going to go into coffee shops or shopping malls. You know, we'll, we'll just stay at the Hilton and enjoy the sunshine. And um, I'm going to call the UJA. And he looked, he was like, what? What do, you, what do you mean you're going to call the UJA? So I said, but they're the Israel charity, aren't they? They're, you know, and he said, well, oh my goodness. You know, are you sure you really want to do that? Because... They're going to get us if you do. <laughs> anyway, um, 
we flew El Al, we got to Israel. Uh, I remember the people on the plane, they were like, oh, why are you coming to Israel? You know, no one was visiting at the time. But it was absolutely fantastic. It was a most incredible feeling to be back. Um, and UJA gave us a day and they showed us three projects. And one of the projects was an Ethiopian absorption centre. And, and that's a place where the new um, immigrant Olim end up for up to a year learning about how to live pretty much in the, se in the 21st century. And I remembered, um, you know, from in the 90s, reading the story about uh, Operation Solomon, you know, when, when uh, at the headlines were 14 and a half thousand, you know, Falasha airlifted to the safety of Israel in just 36 hours. By the way, we don't use the term Falasha now for Ethiopian Jews because um, it's actually derogatory. It means outsider or stranger. Um, anyway, what was more amazing for me um, at that time of reading that headline was, was to learn that there were black Jews. I had no idea. And, and, uh, and then to be in Israel then and hear that the Aliyah was still continuing. So, you know, when you think about Aliyah, you think the biggest obstacle is going to be about language. Um, my Syrian grandmother, for example, never really learned to speak English. Uh, but here was a community where everything about living in Israel was different. You know, they were literally catapulted 2000 years into the 21st century. Um, and one of the things they showed us on that visit was a mock supermarket you know, with shelves of um, cereal boxes and chocolate and um, packets of uh, crisps and, and what have you. Because in Ethiopia, you know, milk comes from a cow, not in a carton. So how are they going to navigate processed food? They had no idea what processed food was. Anyway, um, as for being Jewish, well, their laws of practice were based totally on what's written in the Torah. So everything's taken literally. You know, at Pesach, uh, they're told to eat unleavened for, for, um, uh, for seven days, and that's what they do. Uh, they, they break the plates and they make new plates. Uh, the laws of Nida, family purity, okay? You're supposed to separate from your wife, it says, for seven days. They put the wife into the hut next door. Um, uh, there were absolutely no uh, oral laws to tell them otherwise because they'd lived isolated from the rest of the Jewish world. So the following year was my daughter's bat mitzvah year, Sophie. And we decided to take her to Israel. Where else? Sorry? Ah, can whoever's chatting uh, unmute, uh, sorry, mute, please. Anyway, we decided to take her to Israel for a two week trip. And once again, of course, we called the UJA and said, what can we show her? And they said, well, would you like to join an Ethiopian bar and bat mitzvah ceremony in Jerusalem? And would you like to join the kids beforehand on their teal? Yes. Well, can you imagine 40? Ethiopian children on a bus and a little white girl, no common language, nothing, but within an hour, all the girls were chanting her name and braiding her hair. And she bonded with a little girl called Yet Nebesh. And now I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to share my screen. I hope this works. Okay, here we go. Can everybody see that? Yeah, hopefully you can. We can, we can. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's Sophie. The, here she is with Yet Nebesh. Um, oops, there we go. Anyway, on that trip, I'll just show you some of the, the pictures of that ceremony. Sorry, they're a little bit grainy, these early ones. Um, on that trip, you know, I made two promises to UJA. I said, firstly, 
you know, we've got to get people, we've got to get people back to Israel. And um, secondly, I really want to share the story of the Ethiopian Aliyah to British Jews uh, because we just don't know about it. And it just seemed so obvious to me um, that what we needed to do was twin the kids. So I said to the chair at the time um, and the chair of the programme, this wonderful man, Larry Gould, who actually he had initiated uh, the Bar Bat Mitzvah in, in the first place. It was led by this uh, by by um, the Manchester community actually um, and I said to them you've just got to twin these kids so that's what happened and in those early years you know uh, of developing the program to include the twinning now we really had a lot of fun and I kind of you know um, I did my own marketing um, I'd run an advertising agency for a few years in my uh, career earlier below the line uh, producing printed literature so I was able to kind of transfer that skill set into promoting this Barn Bat Mitzvah program in which we'd called Project 1213 in those early years. And um, I worked with first class professionals um, in the provinces initially Manchester and Glasgow it hadn't become a mainstream UGI project at that stage and I also worked directly with the Israel office. Um, I asked for pictures and profiles of each child and we produced these twinning packs for uh, the UK families and we literally made up the program as we went along. I mean, I, I shouldn't really say that, but um, it's true. But what we did was we adapted it as we learned more about the needs of the, of the Alim. Anyway, over the years, I made regular visits to the SPAT Absorption Centre. Um, I built a relationship with the professionals at UJIA and, and the professionals in Israel. And, and we worked together to prepare the British families to meet their twins. And they, in turn, you know, had to prepare the Olim to meet us, which was a huge challenge on many, many levels. The programme was beginning to get more attention. Um, and um, during one of the trips, the head of the uh, uh, of the Aliyah, the Jewish agency, asked to meet me, and he said, "What can we do to help you?" And at the time, we wanted more people to learn about this incredible uh, story, um, and we had uh, started up twinning clubs um, all over the UK, and in fact, South Hampstead. Thank you, South Hampstead. They were the first ones to pilot this idea of having a twinning club, which would allow a lot more uh, young kids to twin their bar bat mitzvah. Anyway, I said to the to them, the this gentleman, I can't remember his name now, at the Jewish agency, and I said, listen, we need families <laughs> who've got kids of the right age co cohort. So when they come into Israel, just make sure they go to the SPAT absorption center. And, and that's what he did. Um, Anyway, it wasn't easy, you know, it, it really wasn't easy. Culturally, the, the families were miles apart. Um, the Olim, especially the parents, struggled to adapt to their new life in Israel. Uh, the children learned very quickly. They became the teachers of the parents. You know, how was this going to fit into a patriarchal culture where the eldest were the most respected and the children um, are supposed to kiss the knees of their parents as a sign of respect. I mean, imagine if you're a little Ethiopian child and you're, you know, or limb and you're coming back home with your school friend um, and you're supposed to kiss the knees of your parents. I think that's not going to go down too well. Anyway, on top of this, we were expecting um, the Olim to understand more about diaspora Jewry and the British who looked and acted so differently. Uh, we encountered problems on a daily basis. And just for example, very simple things, just to give you an idea, that we, we couldn't have understood at the beginning. Um, we, we was like trying to get parents and children together at the same time for a learning session, you know, in the absorption centre. You know, in the absorption centre, you know, we're not having to tell them to come from anywhere. They're all under one roof. 
but it was impossible to get them all there at the same time in those early days. And why? Because in Ethiopia, there's just no concept of time. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we learned that for healthy integration, um, it was really proud to teach the children, uh, sorry, really important to teach the children to be proud of their Ethiopian roots at the same time, obviously, as being an Israeli citizen. Without this pride, many teenagers, um, you know, end up, we learn, with an identity crisis and they can align themselves with black African culture. So the program developed further into kind of what it is today now, um, which is a, it's an integration program, you know, and the bar and bat mitzvah really is the icing on the cake and entices families to take part. And the impact of EBBM flourished as we worked together um, to overcome the obstacles and more and more families um, in the UK learned about EBBM um, and, you know, my promise to get more families to Israel became a reality. And I can tell you that over, uh, over these last, this period of, I don't know, 14, 15 years, um, we have sent over a thousand people um, to Israel to meet the Olim and take part in these celebrations. And this is uh, little girl, Sophie Grabina, with her twin. This is her twin's mum and Sophie's mum. And here we are visiting their home, um, their apartments where they live, you know, allowing the uh, Ethiopian families to host us is a huge honour for them. Um, just some more pictures here. Okay, so. Uh, I was talking to you just now about the importance of, of roots and this is Selenet. yeah, here she is. Um, this photo was taken, by the way, by Bobby Bray. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> we bought Selenet to, uh, to London, to the UK, actually. She, she toured a bit um, and spoke in, in some of our schools. Um, uh, to tell her story. And Selenet was one of the very first twins um, all those years ago. Uh, she's now grown up, she's, she's just got engaged. And she came to tell us how when she came to, um, to, to Israel with her family, uh, though all those years ago, how her father had talked all about Jerusalem being, you know, the land of milk and honey, and as a little girl, that's she thought that that the uh, she was going to get off the plate and see Israel looking in that way. But anyway, um, she went on a route, the, our first roots pro program, um, and she won the competition that we were running at the time, which meant that she was awarded a laptop computer and a telephone line that I have to say continues to be paid for today in her parents' home. Um, she has many siblings and, and um, they have the benefit of that. Now she became, she knew she was being mentored. She became a top student. She had grade A's in every subject. Um, and, and then she reached kind of her teenage years and she told us that she wobbled. She said there was a lot of racism in school. You know, she didn't look like her friends. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time, but she then thought back to this project that she did with us, her Roots project, and that's what helped to keep her strong. So there is a postscript to the story now. We, we uh, ceased to work in um, absorption centres. Um, we are now working in, in the town of Kiryat Bialidk. And the reason for this is, I'm going to show you a few slides now of when um, I went to Ethiopia. Uh, this is the market. This is, this is uh, if you want to go shopping, this is where you go. And um, these are uh, uh, pictures of 
the Falasha villages that they're actually uh, the Jewish, uh, the Beta Yisrael don't live there anymore. Um, they're really just tourist sites. Here we go. So this is the last day of school. It's about 2014. And um, it became apparent to us that, that um, we were not going to be able to have enough families living in absorption centers coming, coming to Israel because uh, in the compound, um, although there were still 2,000 Ethiopians waiting to, to come into Israel, four, only 400 were going to be allowed into Israel uh, for what was to be the last mass aliyah at the time. So this is us in the last day of school and the synagogue. So we then um, had to decide what to do. Um, we had this huge, huge wealth of experience um, and we decided to take the program to a new level and we put it into the town of Kiryat Bialik where there is a large Ethiopian Israeli population. Um, now we were dealing with a community that didn't have the safety net of an absorption centre um, and when we initially started with the program there uh, there was nothing to pull them together, no leaders, no rabbi, no community centre they were living isolated from each other. So um, this is the professional Sefton here on the right hand side. He called me and he said, what shall we do? I said, I think we'd better go and see the mayor. So off I went to Israel, to Kiryat Bialik to see the mayor. And um, we explained to him about EBBM and what the community needed to help them integrate and surprisingly, he said, Karen, whatever you want, which um, we left thinking, really? And he's a marvellous mayor. His name is Eli Dorsky, and he absolutely has delivered his, wor uh, his word. And the programme remains in Kiryat Bialik today, and they are a terrific partner to us. And the reason why I'm showing you this picture is the impact has been so profound. This woman here, her name is... Uh, um, Maya and um, she she was a mother of one of the first kids that we bat mitzvahed there and she was terribly shy she didn't say boo to a goose um, her husband unfortunately was in in prison um, and and now she is actually a leader in the community through our follow-up programs um, and actually sits on the school council and then the most remarkable miraculous thing happened. Uh, we were a catalyst for the building of a brand new Ethiopian community centre uh, where all the community um, can enjoy many activities together. So that's the uh, story about um, uh, Ethiopian Bermitzvah. Uh, shall I pause there to see if anybody has any questions or shall I carry on and carry on with the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, lovely. Maybe after. You won't be shy to ask me. <laughs> so I'm going to screen share again and I'm moving on to um, talk about Mission Possible. So going back to 19, here we go, that two, that, sorry, not 19, um, 2005, um, as I've said, I've made a commitment to get people to Israel. There we go. Um, and the first thing Peter and I uh, decided to do in order to achieve that was to take a few friends on tour for a week. So... Um, we, we did that, uh, two couples, and we said, no Hilton hotels. Uh, anyway, despite having to stay in some very creative accommodation, they became just as inspired as us and, and came back and said, Karen, you know, you've got to run Mission, so, um, and we've got a name for you, we should call it Mission Possible. So with the help of two girlfriends, Linda and Cara, 
um, who helped to found the mission in those early days. Uh, mission Possible was born in 2006 uh, with a vision to inspire and connect people off the beat track to experience our history, the land, the people, the food, and the successes and the challenges. And this is a um, quotation from one of our participants who came with us two or three times, Nina Sandler. Um, and she said, Mission Possible was a revelatory experience for me after many years of viewing Israel through a very superficial tourist prism it gave me a very different perspective, helping me appreciate all that Israel has achieved and the challenges it still faces. And over the years, we've done incredible things. We've met MKs, we've met um, Holocaust survivors, notably Hannah Pick, who was Anne Frank's best friend. Um, we visited Army and Air Force bases. We volunteered on them, dressed up in uniform cooked in the kitchens, packed bags. Um, we've had security briefings from some very senior army spokespersons. We've heard from journalists, uh, the British ambassadors, and ordinary Israelis with extraordinary stories who have inspired and amazed us. And of course, we visited many projects that are helping the most socially challenged in Israel. So here I am with my two friends that inspired me to start the mission, Kara and Linda. Um, and we are um, visiting a project that UJA still support today uh, called Kibbutz Eshbal. And it's a project uh, that has a boarding school for vulnerable teenagers who fall through the cracks of society. Um, and it's their last chance to rehabilitate and, and have some kind of normative life. Uh, and the idea is they join at the age of 15 and they finish at the age of 18, um, having taken their bagrut. And if they don't pass their bagrut, um, they have no chance of getting into the army. And without being in the army, they've got no chance of a career. Anyway, um, a new dormitory had just been funded to build, um, sorry, it, to, that it had been built that, were going, that was going to allow an additional 20 young teenagers to be saved from a possible life in prison or drugs uh, or sleeping rough on the streets or even worse and and you know money needed to be raised to pay for this um, uh, rehabilitation program for the 20 young people so we set about trying to recruit people, women to come on this mission and we were <laughs> um i wouldn't say we failed but we, it, 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 we just couldn't get a lot of people to attend. We, we got another two, so there were five of us all together. But, but, quality over quantity. We were so fired up when we got back. Um, we asked UJA to send us profiles of all the young teenagers. Um, they weren't able to name them, but we, we gave them alphabetical uh, letters uh, told their stories and we went to people and businesses and we had every one of them sponsored um, and raised £250,000. Um, and here we are, we went back the next year. We took men with us on that trip. We had about 18 participants. Uh, we have run a couple of the missions with, uh, with, with both men and women. And here we are, we're making a sitting corner for the students so that they had somewhere lovely uh, with a lovely view to go um, during their recreational periods. Um, oh, now I didn't show you in the background, just quickly. See this lady here, just wanted to point her out. She was there, one of our students, one of the students that was put on the uh, course. So fast forwarding to this lady, her name is Efrat. And this picture was taken about six years after our first visit to Eshbal. Um, and like all those that attend the school prior to being rehabilitated, this young woman 
um, really had no future. I can't uh, divulge her actual story, but I can tell you that she was found living on the streets. Anyway, um, I met her again at a UJA women's lunch. Um, I was giving the appeal and unbeknown to me, if her act had been brought to London to share her beneficiary story as part of the appeal. And, and we, we got put together, you know, to, to rehearse it. Anyway, when I realized she was from Eshbal and she realized that I was from Mission Possible, she literally fell into my arms crying and said that we'd saved her life. And um, she's an amazing young woman. Eshbal had enabled her to graduate. She entered the army where she held a responsible position. She went on to university. She then did a teaching course and chose to give back by working in a boarding school for at-risk Ethiopian primary school children. And it's such a beautiful story of, of how um, life goes round in a circle and how you know she chose to do something for others that had been done to her. But there's a connection uh, too with South Hampstead Synagogue because she contacted me while she was working at this, at this um, boarding school for these little kids at risk and said they, they've got holes in their socks and holes in their underwear and they've got no clothes and the school have got no budget and can you help me? And at the time we were running an Israel fund, do you remember? And Danny Cohen was chairing it and I spoke to Danny and then said, what can you do? And it was so wonderful that we were able, South Hampstead was able to give her a grant uh, so that she could use the money to buy clothes for the children. And we visited this project many times um, to be updated about all the different programs uh, that they use to rehabilitate the students. This one particularly is with, with dogs. Fantastic. Okay, so um, moving on from an ongoing project to a completed project. Uh, and I've included it to show really just how dynamic women can be if they put their force behind a fundraising effort. And this shows, this slide shows our 214 mission visiting the Jordan River village. And can you recognize the only man in the village? Um, well, I've got his name there, it's Chaim Topol, as in Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and someone even more famous than him, or as famous, uh, Paul Newman was actually the founder of this special place where seriously ill children from all communities, Jewish, Arab, Druze, can have a holiday whilst being medically cared for. Um, many of the staff and doctors are volunteers. Um, all the facilities, including a swimming pool, even a zip line, allow for wheelchairs. IV units in the dorms have got heads of Mickey Mouse, um, mealtimes. Um, the kids have got clowns to entertain them. And it's really a world-class facility that over a period of a few years, uh, the UGI Women's Division raised significant funds that contributed to building this village. And I think we can really be very proud of all that they achieved. On the mission, we meet people we would otherwise not have the opportunity to meet. And this is another way of understanding the diversity of Israel's society better. And more often than not, we do this by being hosted for lunch or dinner in the private homes of people from different communities. So this is Nasreen. She's an Arab Israeli living in Jaffa with the most memorable life story that honestly, you just couldn't make it up. Um, it includes hearing about um, Arab mafia, uh, demands for protection, and the fact that her husband witnessed a murder that forced him into hiding and Nazreen to fend for herself. Now you can see we're being hosted. She's made us an amazing vegetarian lunch, um, all Arab cuisine. Uh, and, and this is the first time, it's the first time we've been into an Arab women, woman's home. 
but it's also the first time that she has uh, hosted Jewish women. So that's quite something, and Jewish women from the, from the diaspora. And this is the only way that she can uh, make a living because like many of the minority populations in Israel, especially the women, um, it's very hard for them to find gainful employment. But uh, booking um, is something they can do and do brilliantly, and it's a way of their earning a living. Um, I mentioned that we have a strong relationship with our British ambassadors, and it's just a picture of us with the, um, in, the, in the home <laughs> of our British ambassadors at the embassy um, and, and we always try to have some kind of briefing about current Israel-UK relationships and trading and the great thing is that Britain does support some of the work that we do, especially um, work that promotes coexistence and tackles social inequalities. So um, the mission is designed for us to look back as well as look forward. And so much of the new state of Israel's history has happened in our lifetime. So that's amazing if we can experience that with people who were there at the time. And I think this iconic photo, of course, of the three soldiers is recognized worldwide. And what a privilege it was for us to meet with Sion Karasanti he took us back to the Six Day War in 67. We walked with him through the old city. We were mesmerized as he relived the action. He talked of having to walk over dead soldiers' bodies in trenches, um, and at every turn he expected to, shot, to be shot. And I think it was a big surprise to those soldiers that actually um, um, they, they won. So from the highs of a success story, you know, to the, to the um, lows of a tragic one. And um, our eye, eyes, that you can see these are not professionally uh, taken photographs. Bobby, we should have had you with us. Um, you know, that we've got those horrible tiger eyes on these photos, but actually they're probably like that because we've been crying for about five minutes beforehand. Anyway, this is Karnit Goldwasser. Her husband, Udi, um, was on his way, was on his last day of reserve service. Uh, they were newly married. She tells a story how she was waiting for him. Um, she had cooked him a special dinner uh, and um, she couldn't get hold of him. Anyway, he was on his last day of reserve. He'd been guarding the Lebanese border with another soldier and was kidnapped by the Hezbollah. And of course, this kidnapping triggered the Second Lebanese War. Cartneet uh, told us this heartbreaking story about how she's waiting and waiting and then suddenly gets that knock on the door and sees the uh, soldiers um, coming to tell her what's happened to her husband. Um, she spent two years lobbying for his release with world leaders, including Blair and Bush, putting pressure on the government. But it wasn't until she got um, the bodies back that she knew whether her husband was uh, going to be released dead or alive. And um, this is one of our current programmes. This is an amazing programme. It really promotes coexistence. Uh, it's called the Equaliser. You can see that face in the background, Prince William, who visited, uh, not last year, just at the end of the year before. Um, and it's, it's one that we introduced to the British government and they do support it. I think they still support it. Um, anyway, it offers Arab uh, and Jewish uh, school children aged between 10 and 12 from very severely disadvantaged backgrounds the opportunity to play football. Um, but in order to qualify to play, the kids have to agree to attend extra lessons um, to aid their studies. And the impact of this programme is really win-win all round. You know, the evaluations of it have shown us that there's a decrease in violent behaviour, um, 
obviously the coexistence angle, the, the kids are not thinking, oh, I'm playing with an Arab child or a Jewish child. Uh, the social abilities of the children are improved and the kids, of course, have a better education, which therefore gives them a chance of a better life. Now, my last story really is just to tell you um, about something that happened on, on, on the last mission that we took, which was in November 2018. Uh, and I don't know if any of you remember that um, a deep undercover Israeli commando was killed in Gaza. It's a botched operation. Um, this is real life Fowder, if you like. And the soldier hadn't been named at the time and we were we were participating in our mission um, and our itinerary had included a visit to the girls equalizer program which was in the Druze village of Julis. Anyway the day before we're due to go to Julis UJA were informed that the soldier had come from Julis. He was a Druze soldier and the whole village was in mourning. And we thought, oh my God, that's it. The visit's going to have to be canceled. We felt sick for this community. We'd been, we'd visited before. Um, but then we had a big surprise because rather than them wanting us to visit, uh, to cancel the visit, uh, we heard from the, the, our contact there, happened to be the, the, soldier, the cousin of the soldier, um, that actually they wanted the mission to go ahead. And not only should it go ahead, but that it would honour the soldier's family if we visited the house of mourning. Now that sounds really odd, doesn't it? Um, but to put this into perspective, arranging to meet beneficiaries, you know, and they're preparing for our visit. The, the, usually if it's children or young adults, you know, they... They want to have an activity with us or, um, you know, they usually put on a put on um, a lovely display of food or, um, you know, they want to uh, have a presentation. Um, it's really a big effort. Um, and, and UJA and this mission, it's it's well respected in the Galil and our visits, not not to be big headed, but they're a, they're a big deal and they're a big deal because we show that we're not just helping, you know, from a financial aspect, but we really care deeply about these vulnerable communities. And we show them that when we go and see them. Um, well, visiting the House of Mourning was extremely hard. It was the same as walking into a shiver house, a Jewish shiver house, um, a religious one. Uh, the women were sitting in one room, the men were sitting in another room. We met the soldier's uh, wife, the mother, uh, the grandmother. We felt terribly honoured to be able to pay our respects to the family um, whose husband and son and grandson had given his life for the state of Israel, given his life for us, you know. So the mission possible, just to conclude, um, please God will be able to get there next year. I'm not sure about this year. Uh, the ladies, we've raised well over a million pounds. Don't know ex the exact amount, but it must be something like that. And, and um, it's just fantastic because we know that what we've done is we've aided social change for Israel's most severely disadvantaged youth. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing there. I've got one short share for you now. I'm take a sip of water. Does anybody have any questions? No? I don't have any questions, Karen, but I just want to say just amazing, amazing, amazing story and presentation. And uh, I'm sure you are very proud. You should be very proud. And it's very, very emotional. Um, really, really maybe, quite amazing. Astounding. Maybe we'll, leave, maybe we'll leave the questions to the end, Karen. I'm sure okay, well, just, just probably about, um, I don't know if I've run on a bit too much, guys, but um, just, a, just another 10 minutes, probably. Um, and to, just to talk to you about what happened what's happened next. Uh, and I'm going to go back to screen sharing <laughs> some more pictures. Hang on. Where are we? All right. So uh, final share. 
a second. Okay. Oh, security alert. Hang on. Okay, here we are. So I'm just going to move on now from the engagement of women on Mission Possible to the engagement of women's philanthropy. Don't all, don't all disappear now. <laughs> don't worry, no pledge cards handed round today. Um, the mission attracts, as you could see, you know, a small group of women. Um, but what about reigniting the power of the collective? You know, as we saw from the success of helping to build the Jordan River Children's Village. You know, women coming together in that way uh, to support UGI's mission um, hasn't happened much since. Uh, and that's not to say that women aren't doing their bit. Of course they're doing their bit. Um, they certainly are in all different kinds of ways, but generally we tend to react to needs that are easier to immediately understand and are emotive. But when it comes to Israel, the narrative is now so complex that you need to dig below the headlines in order to connect to the beneficiaries and understand the enormous social challenges that affect thousands of people. Because for all Israel's successes, there is so much poverty and need. Anyway, in uh, 2015, the chair of the annual women's lunch, she'd done an amazing job, she stepped down, uh, but there was no one to step up. You know, where was the queue of women? We seem to have lost a generation of female leadership. So, um, you know, as a volunteer, you're looking for the holes. So I agreed to be the new women's chair, uh, uh, actually co-chair with um, Louise Jacobs. And the first thing that we did was to change the lunch into a, fu a fun gala style dinner which attracted all generations. Um, we focused on honouring young female leadership in the UK and also awarding inspiring beneficiaries in Israel whose, whose life had been turned around. And this young man that you're seeing now came from one of our children's villages that we still support called the Carmiel Children's Village. His name is Zohar. And he told the story about how as a little boy he was five years old. Um, he lived in, in the uh, mixed town of, um, of Akko and was always getting into trouble with gangs and it just wasn't safe for him to, to stay and live there. And, and he, he got sent, the social worker said he'd be much safer going to stay in this children's village in Carmiel. Um, and he, he talked about how when he got there, it felt like heaven because he just didn't have to worry about being attacked anymore. Anyway, the reason why we awarded him was because he's a fantastic young man and a bit like if Rat uh, decided to give back to the community that had helped him so much. And, and he volunteers now at the Carmel Children's Village on a regular basis. And here are just some of the pictures. Um, and again, like I said, all generations we had girls in their 20s to women in their 80s attend these evenings. Um, but I needed to learn more about women's philanthropy. And who better to learn from than the Lions of Judah? And this, these are an, it's an international community of about 18 and a half women. It was founded over 40 years ago by Norma Kiplin Wilson. I've met her, she's a fascinating woman. She tells the story about how she dreamt of, of, of the image of uh, lion, of the lion, and that gave her the inspiration. Um, she chaired at the time the Miami Federation's uh, Women's Division. Um, and in case you're not aware, the North American Federations, they're called UJA, United Jewish Appeal, um, they're the equivalent of UJA, Jewish Care, Norwood, CST, all under one roof. Um, so that when you make a donation, it's kind of spread amongst Israel and local needs. Anyway, the next international conference was in 2016, but I had to become a lion. And there were no lions in London, no lions in the UK. 
Um, but as a homeowner uh, in Israel, I was el eligible to join the Israeli Lions. So here we are, became a member, went with 25 Israeli women. I swear they, they were all on Duracell batteries. They had energy like I've never experienced before. Um, and we went off, we went to Washington. This picture was taken on the last day of the conference. They like to make a big impact, these Israelis, and um, all the different local federations paraded around the big hall. And um, we were made to wear these ridiculous uh, bunny ears. But anyway, we had, we had some great fun. But there's no words to explain, seriously. Um, the experience, you know, walking into a room with 1,500 of these lines of Judah from all walks of life, you know, they were all passionate about making a difference in Israel and their communities. And we heard some incredible, incredible um, stories in, in the plenaries. Anyway, surprisingly, I learned that it wasn't just women with a certain level of means who gave, uh, but it was also an important life choice for women who would rather sacrifice something in their life to, in order to pay uh, the $5,000 to be a lion. And um, I could ask you, you know, can anybody think how much do you think they raised in two days? No, does anybody want to guess? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's $36 million. Super staggering, isn't it? Anyway, the Lions of Judah, they're all over the world and they're represented in the 51 states of North America and 34 countries in the rest of the world, now including the UK. Uh, we launched in January 2018 after a really complex negotiation to get our model of giving right for us. Um, and although our system of giving here is not federated, we felt it was important to be a bit more like the American model and for our gifts to be spread between Israel and local needs. And we wanted, you know, the women who were going to be um, becoming members to have real choice in how um, they use their philanthropy. Uh, the other 33 countries, by the way, send 100% of their donations to Israel. It's a real common bond between all the lions. Um, that Israel is, is a big focus. So 50% of our donations go to Israel causes and 50% stays in the UK. And that 50% is split between our fantastic UJA leadership programs and also some of our lesser known local needs. So for example, um, we've chosen and awarded uh, grants to 11 other charities and we provided them with these grants for a very specific need within their organization uh, for example like this drama cabin which we donated to the Gesha school for children who've got severe learning disabilities um, in israel here we go got our plaque on it um, in israel our focus is to empower at risk young women and children. And we've supported three programs that address these needs. And I'm going to talk very briefly about one of them, introduce you to a young lady called Ellie Sheva. There she is with us. Um, she lives um, another children's village, uh, the Ramata Dasa Children's Village. And it's a village for kids at risk um, who are unable to live with their families. Again, maybe they're at risk because of abuse or the child has behavior problems, um, or there are serious issues within the family that make it not safe for the child to live at home. Um, when I first met Ellie Sheva doing a recce of projects, um, she was very shy. She sat very close to her mentor um, and we were chatting away and trying to get to, you know, bring her out of herself um, and asking questions. And then I asked her, what's the best thing about living at Ramatadasa. And her eyes absolutely welled up with tears and she reached for her mentor and she said, it was experiencing love. 
for the first time. And I guess that says it all, doesn't it? Something that we take for granted for our children. And there are so many kids out there in need that do not even have love. So Lion of Judah, what can I tell you? It's very much a work in progress. It's going to take time to change attitudes to women's giving. But in the meantime, I think we've made a good start. Um, I want to thank, um, I want to finish by thanking everyone who's accompanied me on my UJA volunteering journey. I want to thank you all for being here to listen to it. Um, but I particularly want to thank all the EBBM families who twin their children, all the Mission Possible participants, and all these incredible Line of Judah women who've given hope, empowerment, and love to young women and girls at risk, like Ellie Sheva. And finally, a big thank you to all the professionals at UJIA, because none of this could have happened without you. That's it. I think we can open for a couple of questions, but I'd just like to, to thank you. And I mean, your proof, your proof that uh, with passion, uh, you can make an enormous difference. One person can make such a difference to so many people. And I'm so glad we asked you to talk. I mean, that was, uh, that was quite you. wonderful to see all the work that you've done just from one one little seed back in 2003 of wanting to go to Israel and and you saw something and you acted on it. I mean, you put one foot in front of the other and, uh, you know, and things grow and, you know, what you've achieved is, is just superb. So thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, can I open, can I, any questions? Can you just raise your hand? I'll, I'll flip between the screens. Anyone Gillian, got? yeah. Gillian. Um, incredibly, very, very interesting and um, fascinating talk. Um, the original people that you had, um, the, the Falash or the, the Ethiopians, have, have they actually integrated into to Israeli society? Do they intermarry? What's the situation of the original ones? Mine, when you call them the original ones, so the first Aliyah wave, uh, were were the, the Ethiopians that came were better Yisrael. They called themselves better Yisrael, the House of Israel. They hadn't been they hadn't converted uh, like the the um, Ethiopians that have been brought. There are still some being brought into the country today. In fact, there was a recent uh, aliyah uh, that was made with the Jewish agency, and they are the Falasha Mura. They had um, been forced to convert to Christianity. Um, and they they have now returned uh, back to their Jewish roots, and they they have over the years been also brought in, into Israel. Um, do they integrate? They they do they do, but it's not easy. Um, yes, I think there are some mixed marriages. Um, I think that the that from my understanding is that there is still a huge amount of prejudice. You know, we don't like to think that there's racism in Israel, but it does exist. It's very challenging for uh, the Ethiopian community to, you know, get the better jobs, get, um, um, you know, to advance themselves in society in the same way as perhaps uh, a white is Israeli, Israeli can. Um, but it's, a, you know, it's a work in progress. And... Uh, there are many incredible organisations out there who are doing a lot in order to help redress this balance. Karen, can I just ask you, I mean, do the original bar and butt mitzvah twinning, did the relationships still remain? And, you know, I mean, do you follow, well, do you follow yeah. what happened? So look, I told you about Selenet and she was, a, she was one that we, a young lady that we followed. But it wasn't possible to do that uh, for the uh, for the kids that we twin that were living in absorption centers, because once they left the absorption centers, they went all over Israel and it, we didn't have the resources, you know, to follow their progress. 
but some of the families who happened to speak English and were able to continue a relationship with their twins did so. And over the years, you know, we have, um, you know, we have heard uh, of stories and, and what's happened to um, some of these young twins. I mean, I know of a, a Manchester family that stayed in touch and their twin, Fala Gush, I think her name was, anyway, um, invited the twins, her British twins family to her wedding, wanted them to be there. Karen, it's Ruth. I was just going to ask you what's next, Cass? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know, Ruth, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> now I know, I know. So you, you've not hung up the mantle for um, uh, for, for Ethiopian twinning, but it, it, it has. It have, obviously it has its challenges now. But and I know um, um, the uh, lines of Judah is is a big one. But I mean, is there anything else on your cards? Are you taking it easy? No. I, well, I've, this year has been a difficult year for everybody, really, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and you know, UJA is an organisation that's. that's done tremendously to have it you know reorganizing itself in this period of time so there's a lot of work going on behind the mm -hmm. scenes there um but yeah i mean in in a sense i've had to take a little bit of a back seat to um allow the professionals to get on with doing what they need to do it's been very important okay okay and i'm raring to go ruth oh you are <laughs> <laughs> Karen, can I ask you? Hi, Karen. That was brilliant. hi, Marilyn. Hi, that was absolutely great. You're amazing. Um, but could you expand on the line of Judah a little bit? I know there's a little bit of controversial thought about it in England. I know Americans have a very different attitude to donations and raising money. Um, could you expand on the actual um, details of it? The yes, I can. When you, when you, when you, so when you talk about that, it's got a bit of controversy here. What, in what sense? The well, fact that we're asking women for large amounts of money. Yes, and that you have <laughs> to pay. You have to pay to show when you wear this line of Judah badge. It means you've paid a lot of money, and it's sort of become a bit clicky and clubby. And as far as I've heard, in America, if you don't pay every year. Um, you can't wear the badge officially. I don't know whether that's the same thing in England. So you've got to have the money or does it show that you've had the money to buy the badge? That, that's yeah. come across to me anyway. Yeah, I mean, I guess that it's very easy to kind of, um, uh, to assume things about Lion of Judah. Um, but like I said, you know, it's not just people who've got the means um, to, to make large dime, uh, large uh, donations, there are women that make, you know, that it's a life choice for them because they really believe that um, they can make a significant difference by becoming a member of Lion of Judah to the, you know, the projects and the organisations that they're supporting. But let me let me just explain. In this country, the Lion of Judah generally worldwide, you have to pay a minimum donation of five thousand dollars. We've had it agreed in, in, the, in the UK because we are aligned with um, Lions of Judah in Israel and Karen High Sod specifically. Um, and they set, um, it's their brand. And so we have to really be in alignment with, uh, with the rest of the women from around the world and what they give. Um, and it is, a, you know, it, unashamedly, it is a, a women's philanthropy platform. Um, so we give £3,000. Now, unlike America, where you can give any amount above $5,000 to become a lion, um, and the more that you give then allows you to wear a diamond or a ruby or an emerald on your brooch to signify the amount of money that you're giving, um, we don't do that because it's just not in our culture. Uh, to do that. So we all give the same. Everybody is equal. It's a £3,000 donation and it is an annual donation to remain uh, as a member in the same way as being a member for a club. You know, if you don't pay your donation the following year, then you cease to be a member. Um, and the idea is very much that it is collective philanthropy, that we work together as a group of women. We decide, you know, how is how do we want to make a difference? Um, and And we have 
meetings, we call them cabinet meetings, anybody who's a lion is welcome to join the meeting and make those decisions, you know, together with the other women. Um, it's, it's, you know, it is a lot of money, but for many people, it's, you know, they can do that. It's a choice. Um, but we've, you know, we're beginning to make a difference. Uh, it's about changing attitudes. There's no question about that. We are not the same as the Americans. Um, but when they started, when Norma tells her story about how they started and she had this dream and she went to her federation, the, the Miami JIA, you know, they laughed at her 45 years ago. What? Asking women to give $5,000, as she says, in the 1970s, you know, giving $5,000 was the same as giving a, you know, paying for a car in those days. You know, it was absolutely unheard of. It was ridiculous to the federations. And in fact, it took her quite a few years before it gathered momentum. And then once it gathered momentum and people understood it for what it absolutely represented, then um, other federations in America wanted to join in. And, and they couldn't because it was a Miami thing and then they had to kind of reinvent it so that other federations can join in. And then it became a worldwide phenomenon. But it seems to me totally uh, incorrect for there not to be that platform in the UK how is it all over the world and we don't have that platform so we, like I said it's a work in progress we're trying to work out what um, works best for us as a British community and we're on that journey okay thanks very much indeed thank you again Karen um, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, have a good week everyone <laughs>